Hello, everyone. We're going to give folks a few more minutes to join us, and then we will go ahead and get started. If you are new to the security tag, go ahead and drop yourself onto the meeting document, which I'm going to paste the link to shortly. Um, and for existing members, go ahead and make sure that you list your name as well. <clears throat> You'll notice some changes to the doc. Um, we're, we're asking everybody as a reminder to um, put your company name and if you have any updates or any working groups or other memberships that you may have within the CNCF, helps allow uh, new members as well as existing members make connections. Hey folks, it's Jim. Hey Jim. Good day, Emily. A quick question before uh, things get underway. I had previously spoken with Ash and Brandon about uh, joining the um, the TOC meetings twice a month and just sort of taking notes and checking in here. Uh, would that be, it's pretty much just like a, in this case, a quick copy past of what happened the other day. Would that be relevant for today's check-in or no? Um, if you would like, just go ahead and drop it in the meeting notes doc underneath of announcements. Um, if you have a link to the notes that you took or a high, quick high level summary, we usually try to go over things during our main working group sessions and keep the presentation sessions fairly clean. Got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Define clean. Try to keep them on topic to the presentation. We, we've got a lively bunch of contributors here and we don't want to derail or take away any time um, with all of the other fabulous work that we have going on. Gotcha. So to that end, I will go ahead and get started. This is a reminder that the meeting is being recorded and posted to YouTube shortly thereafter. Your participation in these meetings is an agreement to abide by the Cloud Native Security Code of Conduct, which can be found in our repository. I need at least one person to volunteer as scribe to ensure any actions and primary content discussed as a result of the presentation is recorded and summarized in the written notes and therefore can be referred to later. Does anybody want to volunteer? No one? Come on, guys. Folks, I need one person. Yeah, it's a presentation. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Shripad. Okay. And then for existing members and working group reps, remember to include your organization and company along with the working group you're involved with the update. Because we have a presentation today, we won't be reading out um, updates. So some quick announcements to go over. The CFP is open for Cloud Native Security Con, Cloud Native Security Con through July 25th. As a reminder, this is a hybrid event. So you can go in person to Los Angeles or attend online virtually. If you're interested in the Cloud Native Serverless Security Paper, the North America Meeting Coordination Poll is available in the TAG Security Serverless White Paper Slack channel. If you're part of the Supply Chain Security Working Group who is developing a reference architecture, there are some user stories that are being broken out into more defined requirements. Those are due in less than two weeks. And there are several open PRs and issues that still need community comments to help triage and review. They're listed in the meeting notes. Okay, Jim, over to you. All right. Um, just in terms of time, uh, do we have about 15 minutes, 30 minutes? How much time should I plan for? You've got about 30 minutes for your presentation, and then we try to leave about another 30 okay. or 15 for Q&A. Perfect. 
All right, thank you. So thank you for having me. Um, hi, everyone. This is Jim Baguadia. I'm co-founder and CEO at Nirmata and also a maintainer on Kivarno. Um, I'm a co-chair in the policy working group, also contribute um, in the multi-tenancy working group. So happy to come and present and talk a little bit about what, you know, what we're doing with Kivarno. So today, you know, I'll just go through a few background slides. We'll, you know, we'll also look at a live demo of how Kiverno works and you know, we'll leave some time for Q&A. Um, so first off, you know, why, why policies? Why, why does any of this matter, of course? And I think some of this will be very familiar, but to me, you know, as folks approach Kubernetes, of course, we know the two main personas, the two main roles are your operators, the cluster admins, and then the developers are the product teams using the cluster, right? And policies within configuration management can serve as a contract to bring together these two roles. So a lot of the complexity that you know, is usually discussed or is talked about in Kubernetes, you know, having uh, declarative configuration management tends to be quite verbose, quite complete in what it can do. And policies can again help in you know, aligning um, and helping manage some of that complexity uh, to make things easier for uh, developers and, and users of the cluster, but also importantly to have that, uh, the ability to give operators the way to manage you know, common configurations, the way to enforce defaults, to apply configuration security um, across their clusters, right? So that's, you know, in terms of the, the, you know, the, I guess the why for policies itself, and then just quickly introducing Kiverno, and we'll talk about you know, um, some of the key concepts and uh, the motivations behind Kiverno, and then go into the features. But what we, you know, uh, the, the whole goal of Kiverno, and you know, as we started the project, was to design a policy engine specifically for Kubernetes and Kubernetes resources itself, right? Um, and the sort of having that focus provides a lot of flexibility and uh, in terms of, you know, adopting Kiverno to work really nicely within Kubernetes. So leverage all of the underlying sort of patterns uh, or, you know, idioms, like for example, knowing what an owner reference is or understanding how pod controllers work. Uh, and also, you know, in terms of the overall experience for both of the personas we talked about, for developers and for operators, again, making this very native to Kubernetes, familiar to Kubernetes, um, using also tools like kubectl, customize, et cetera, uh, which are available to Kubernetes users, right? So the whole idea is just make it simple um, to, to apply, manage, um, and you know, policies to also in terms of getting policy results uh, within clusters and uh, you know, help sort of secure and uh, manage Kubernetes configurations in an easier manner. So by the way, one question we often get asked is what does Kiverno mean? Why, why is it named Kiverno? So Kiverno is a Greek you know, word for govern. So that's kind of why we thought it would be a nice term and fairly applicable to what uh, the problem it's trying to solve. All right, so one other question which always comes up right away and is, you know, well, uh, you know, doesn't OPA do this? Uh, can't we do the same with Drago and Gatekeeper and uh, with the OPA project itself? And yes, of course, uh, OPA is fantastic for managing policies. Uh, and it's, a, you know, one of the things, uh, again, going back to the previous slide, um, is, well, Kiverno was designed just for Kubernetes. OPA is more of a general purpose uh, in a policy management tool, as I'm sure most of you or all of you know. Um, but the main challenge we were trying to address, and as we spoke to you know, users, as we kind of looked at uh, what Kubernetes admins as well as end users wanted, is again, making policies something which are um, a lot simpler to, to write, to manage, and, and to even um, you know, apply them, and I'll talk about some of the differences in features, but also to be able to get results and reports, right? So here's just a quick comparison of what, uh, you know, the same policy would look like uh, in Rego, which is the language that OPA uses, and then how Kiverno defines that same policy. 
um, and you're, you know, this policy is just validating within, you know, a pod to make sure that the file system, the root file system is marked as read-only, right? Um, so both, interestingly, of course, uh, OPA is also, if you, uh, if you look at Rego, uh, it, it is a declarative language, right? And Kivarno is also declarative, uh, but there, I guess it matters what you're trying to declare and do. Whereas, uh, you know, Rego take, takes the approach of being efficient in, in processing data sets and, um, you know, for JSON data, um, Kiverno is more, you know, geared towards understanding what a Kubernetes resource definition looks like and making policies as familiar as possible to folks who already know uh, what a Kubernetes pod looks like or what a Kubernetes, you know, any other resource uh, definition would look like. And the language here is YAML, but it's not so important, you know, what the language is. Of course, if you're uh, generating policies or managing policies through external tools, um, it, you can use any API or just Kubernetes APIs with, with Kiverno uh, because the policy itself um, is a Kubernetes resource, right? So the important aspect here is there's no, you know, there's no separation of the policy definition and then the enforcement. It is a resource. Well, the enforcement happens through Kiverno as an admission controller, uh, but there's no separation of, you know, defining the policy uh, within Kubernetes. So there's no constraint language or anything like that, which you would use with, um, you know, Rego and Gatekeeper to drive parameters. It's all embedded in that one resource. And that resource, just like any other Kubernetes resource, you would manage across your fleet of clusters, you would manage in your CI CD pipeline. Kiverno has support for a CLI as well. So you can apply those policies uh, before you know, they hit any cluster and then at admission controls. And then within clusters, Kiverno does periodic background scans um, also to you know, provide validation checks if you don't want to auto enforce certain rules, you can validate them inside your cluster itself. So uh, that, those are some of the key aspects, right? Making policies, native resources, uh, making policies, um, you know, or defining policies in the same manner or to mimic the structure of what uh, a you know, Kubernetes resource would look like. And again, simplifying the overall management of policies and the policy results across clusters. So just to kind of, um, you know, some of these points I just covered, but the main other things, you know, to point out is, you know, I uh, mentioned some of the features and differences. So one of the things we looked at within Kivarno is its policies, of course, configuration security is a big use case for policies, but it's not just about configuration security and um, one other use case <clears throat> uh, that we feel is pretty, excuse me, let me grab a quick sip of water. Yeah, one of the use case we found, which is very interesting is being able to generate configurations dynamically, right? And that's something which is unique to Kiverno. Uh, where Kiverno can, you know, based on certain triggers, like for example, a classic one is when namespaces are created, uh, Kiverno can automatically generate all of the configurations required for that namespace, right? So things like role bindings, network policies, other defaults for quotas, et cetera, you can automate that, which, you know, and, and that's one example. You can even trigger generate rules based on other, you know, object creation, or even when objects are mutated, like with labels, uh, or if they are, you know, mutated with things like annotations. You can also trigger Kiverno policies based on that. So that expands sort of the use case of policies beyond configuration security to things like automation, uh, and of course, this all ties into the broader security realm, but. It allows you know easy automation of configurations required for certain you know um, certain sets of users or certain resources, uh, and it also allows you know doing interesting things like if you create a namespace and if it has a label PCI, maybe you want a node selector to be injected with certain labels um, you know to put pods or workloads in that namespace on certain you know uh, resources. 
So things like that can now be automated through policies. And again, going back to this concept of using a policy as a contract uh, between dev and ops. And Kiverno supports uh, because, you know, again, it, it uh, inspects all the custom resource definitions. It can understand the structure of CRDs within, you know, installed in the cluster. Um, it can, you know, it supports all resource types with custom resources, et cetera. Um, and, you know, will do validation and things like that on those based on your schema definitions provided uh, within your cluster itself. So quick, you know, view of how Kiverno works, as you can probably, you know, envision it, it installs as a, as a, you know, admission controller as a web hook. Um, so any, any mutating or validating request that's in the API path will be, you know, will be forwarded to Kiverno based on the policies configured. So internally, Kiverno ma maintains an in-memory cache of policies. So all of those are resource, uh, resources defined as policies are scanned um, as well as loaded. And once that's done, you know, there's uh, about three major controllers. So there's the um, webhook, you know, which of course receives all of the admission review requests from the API server and sends back the responses. Uh, there's, you know, uh, a generate controller, which does the, you know, generation of resources based on certain triggers. There's a general policy controller, which is responsible for the reporting and also for, you know, maintaining the policy cache, things, things of that nature. So both of those operate more as in, in the background, whereas, you know, the webhook is uh, what is in the API path itself. And then there's a monitor, you know, component which will in, you know, automatically create the webhook registrations, the you know, certificates and things required to install Kiverno within the cluster itself. Um, there are some other you know, kind of CRs which Kiverno internally uses. So there's the generate request, which is what it uses to um, you know, trigger these generate rules. Uh, there's a policy CR, of course, which is a definition that it watches and manages. And then there's um, on the reporting side, whenever a report needs to be updated, there's change requests uh, created for that. So um, yeah, so today, you know, and Kiverno with 1.4, with the latest release, it supports full HA. So all of this you can run as multiple replicas. Um, and, you know, it does a leader election, of course, to coordinate work across its replicas. Uh, so all of that works fairly easily and in a straightforward manner. Uh, in terms of how it gets configured and uh, how you would scale up Kiverno for larger you know, clusters. Just in terms of the physical sort of architecture view, right? So the, you know, when you install Kiverno and we'll see this live, it installs into a namespace. It's got, you know, as you can imagine, uh, all of the standard sort of uh, fixtures uh, within our resources uh, within Kubernetes. More importantly, and some of this, you know, I'll also talk about uh, some of the conversations um, John and I are having on the security, you know, kind of self-assessment for Kiverno. Um, it, it will create, you know, the right validating mutating webhooks. It creates the right roles. So these are customizable based on permissions you want to allow, things of that nature. So all of these resources will get installed. And of course, if you're removing Kiverno or configuring Kiverno, uh, as an admin, these would be important to note. All right, so let's, you know, in the next section, we can dive in a little bit deeper into the policy structure, but let me quickly pause there, see if there's any questions, thoughts, uh, comments so far. You've got two questions in chat. Um, I'll read the first one to get going. Okay. Uh, this, co this comes from Andres. Uh, when you go back to thinking about validation, um, what if I write a policy that violates security, where it violates means either one, breaks existing policies, or two, violates higher order constraints, for example, compliance or regulatory objective? Yeah, so that's a pretty interesting question. And you know, I guess it is possible to write bad policies, right? And it brings up, um, Another question is how do you know that the policies running in your cluster are trusted, are policies that you know are delivered from the right sources? 
So there are, you know, one of the things we're investigating, and I think there's some work going on also in other communities, is is it possible just like, you know, I, I, I'd seen a project which was looking at signing Kubernetes resources, is it possible to establish some trust change for policies itself, um, you know, to make sure that at least uh, there's no uh, sort of malicious, uh, you know, uh, policy or, uh, you know, uh, other uh, sort of malware delivered as a policy within Kubernetes. Um, the other aspect of it is any inadvertent, you know, uh, let's say you kind of end up writing a policy, which of course uh, accidentally causes some, you know, some breakage or some other problems. And the, for that, of, just like with any critical infrastructure or code, really requires, uh, that requires some proper testing um, and rollout uh, as you would with other resources, right? So yes, it is, you know, policies of course can do harm. Uh, so there's, uh, there, it would be interesting to explore that and, and see again, how um, to restrict what can be done and to make sure at least the policies that are delivered are in fact, the ones you expect to be in your cluster itself. Okay. And there's two more coming in. It, it, it's, we were looking forward to having you come in and talk about this. There's probably gonna be a lot of questions. Um, what I'm gonna do is go read this one, then let's keep going, then we can bring some more at the end um, as we have time. But this is sort of related to what we're just talking about around audit and yeah. um, those policies, how do you test them? You're probably reading this, but I'll, I'll read it for the sake of it. Is there an audit mode um, which is able to do either audit versus enforce um, in, in thinking about either from R&D, CICD, as well as migration? Yeah, so there exactly is that. There is, um a configuration option in validate policies, which does you, which will allow you to set a policy to either audit and just report the violations or to enforce and block that configuration. Also the way Kiverno is designed is we um, have sort of been fairly careful about not impacting existing workloads, but reporting violations on it. Uh, and in fact, we're now looking at features where if, if you do want to enforce policies on existing workloads, how do you do that, right? So how do you, um, if you're rolling out a new policy, obviously you don't want to impact things which are running in production, uh, but you do want to collect that report and you do want to be able to take an, uh, some action on it. So for existing workloads, uh, even when changes are made to them, Kiverno, you know, kind of looks at the diff of the changes and only if there's a violation in that delta, it will block that. So even if you write a blocking policy, uh, we've tried to, you know, make it as foolproof as possible to not impact existing workloads. And, you know, if a pod gets sort of rescheduled, you don't want to block it uh, if it was working correctly, but now happens to enforce new, or violate a new policy but Kiverno will report these and let the admin take uh, an action on it. Okay, so yeah, if you wanna continue and let's, we can pause again for more questions a little bit later. Um, so just to kind of explain, you know, quickly the policy structure itself and what Kiverno policies look like. So it's fairly, you know, straightforward. A policy is a set of rules. Uh, rules are ordered, so they will apply in order. Policies themselves are not ordered and policies cannot override other policies, or anything like that. Each one is evaluated, you know, completely, um, you know, in isolation and, and in an atomic fashion. So uh, once, you know, a rule matches, so there's a bunch of different criteria to match rules or to exclude rules. Uh, then each rule will have the logic to either mutate resources, validate resources, or generate resources, right? And, um, and you can combine these within a, a higher level policy and policies have certain you know, fixtures like things like the validation failure action we talked about, audit or enforce. You can have comments, you can have metadata, things like that within the policy itself. So here's you know, diving right into an example. Here's an example of a full policy. Uh, this one is a little bit more complex than the previous example I showed because it uses this construct called any pattern, right? Which basically means any of these patterns, uh, if they if they apply, then the policy um, you know matches or is validated, right? So here we're trying to make sure that run as non-root is set within a pod uh, security context, either at the container level or at the pod level. 
right? And and that's uh, all this is this policy is doing. Um, and then there's some message and other stuff that you can do. Um, in this case, we yeah we don't have the validation failure action, but if you add that at the policy level, it'll control that auditor enforce behavior. Um, another, you know, so in, in the validate pattern, there are, you know, there's full support for wildcards, there's operators, things like that, and it, it works in a fairly, you know, logical or reasonable manner. So, um, you know, just within your value uh, field of your YAML, you can, you know, kind of combine some of these operations uh, to check if something um, it should be non-empty, should be, you know, there's also, by the way, there's full regex support, which you can combine with James path expression. So you can, the policies can get, you know, more complex than some of these examples. And I'll show uh, how that can be even done with API server lookups, et cetera. Uh, so it's for more complex policies, there's a little bit more complexity, but it's, uh, it's also using standard, you know, you know, or at least well-known tools like James Path and other things, which other CLI tools and even kubectl supports. Um, another example of you know how to mix in some conditionals, right? So these this is these are mutate policies. So by the way, for mutate, uh, Kiberno supports both JSON patches as well as a strategic merge patch, and that is works the same as it would with customize. So if you're familiar with how customize does patches, Kiberno patches work the same way. Or if you prefer, you can use a JSON patch, the RFC 6902 patch syntax, right? So the first example, the first uh, up top is showing the JSON patch syn syntax, um, you know, where it just has an operation and the value you want to insert into your patch. Um, and the second example is showing more of a overlay pattern, which also given no support. So that's more, you know, declarative because you're saying here, I want to make sure if, you know, if the port is defined and it starts with secure, then you want a certain port number. Um, you know, it's a bit of a contrived example, but uh, it's to show this, you know, kind of conditional logic. And the second, you know, example, the third example, uh, this is showing uh, if the port is defined and not, you know, uh, if it's not present, then you want to insert it. But if a value is there, you just leave it alone. Uh, don't do anything, right? So that's how you would do some simple conditionals. And there's other, you know, kind of ways to do more complex operations. Uh, but this is just an example of how mutate would work. And finally, generate is also fairly straightforward, right? So this is showing an example where you have inline data to generate. You can also reference data, you know, which for other, from existing resources. So let's say you have, you know, an existing, you know, role defined in your cluster. You can clone that, and you can also tell Kiberno keep that uh, the copies in sync with the clone. So the pretty cool thing you can do now is for managing things like um, certificates or uh, or even secrets um, for your image registries you can write a generate policy to clone these from a common source. So every time a namespace is created, Kiberno will generate the, you know, the image pull secrets. And you know, if you change that, so when you rotate your you know, credentials, you change it in one place and Kiberno will propagate it to all the existing namespaces uh, where that was cloned from, right? So pretty, pretty straightforward and you know, works as you would expect um, you know, for, for generating and managing resources or resource life cycles as well. All right, and finally on the policy report itself. So just you know, one of the things to quickly mention is the, the policy report here we're using um, is the, the custom resource you know, as defined in the policy working group. So I see Robert is uh, online as well. So Robert and I have the co-chairs there. Um, the CRD, the custom resource defined um, the idea is to have a general policy report which various tools can support. Uh, there's work in progress to, you know, there was a um, Kubebench adapter which was completed. There's work in progress for Falco and Trivi and some other tools, um, you know, and we'd like for other projects to also adopt this policy report to create a common way of reporting, you know, violations of reporting policy results uh, within clusters independent of which tool is um, managing the policies, right? So this is just a quick example of what that looks like, you know, within the cluster itself.
So let's, you know, I'll, I know we have about, I guess, not much time left, about five more minutes. Um, so just going through some of the use cases, the obvious use cases are pod security, general configuration security, uh, applying fine grain, you know, um, RBAC and automatically generating roles um, for various things like namespaces or workloads. Uh, Kiverno, you know, can enforce that and also based on other conditions. Uh, doing things for multi-tenancy for namespaces as a service, managing labels, um, you know, there's some dynamic configuration, you know, like we talked about based on various rules. A new use case, and I'll quickly show a, a demo of this. Uh, it's still alpha. It's not yet in one of the Kiverno releases, but uh, we're, you know, integrating with six store cosine to do image verification uh, through, you know, through, um, uh, by using uh, you know, signatures, by verifying that with your configured registries, et cetera. Um, so those are some of the key use cases. And this is, you know, this list of course expands and uh, there's a lot of interesting ideas in the community. So looking forward to also more feedback, more ideas on what, we, what else can be done with Kiverno. So with that, let's you know quickly go to a demo, and then we'll, based on time, we can come back for more questions. Or you know, certainly I'll be available also on Slack, uh, um, you know, to answer anything else. All right. So let me, you know, what I'll do is I'm going to install. So I'm just going to go to the Kiverno docs. So by the way, our documentation, you know, is pretty complete in terms of getting started, getting things going. Um, so the first thing, you know, actually, in fact, let me, I'll go, I'll start with the image verification demo just because uh, it's something new and it's pretty cool to look at. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to install Kiverno using this YAML. There's a Helm chart available uh, too, but I'm just going to install it with this. And, you know, we'll then, you know, install a policy, which I have, and I'll show that while it's coming up. So the policy I'm going to use is one which is going to use with cosine. I have a registry already created. I have a public key, and I have some images in that registry, both signed and unsigned, right? So here, you know, um, in this kind of uh, in a prototype, what we have is we I'm just saying allow for any any image coming from this registry. I want to verify, you know, that it's signed with this signature. And of course, you know, if you want to deny everything else, you can. But here, I'm allowing everything else. Um, but only checking for images from this registry, right? So, all right, so Kiverno should have been installed. If I just quickly look at what the installation did. Oops, I gotta type correctly. All right, so everything's running. And now the next thing I wanna do is just install this one, you know, um, certificate it's, uh, or this policy. So I'm going to grab the path to that and we'll just go ahead and apply it into my local cluster, right? Okay, so it, it took this policy and then the next thing, I'll just go back to this document and happy to share that also later. So the first thing I want to do is just run a container which should which has been signed with that public or the private key which matches that public key. So that should work um, and you know should be allowed to run within my cluster itself. The one other thing which is interesting is what Kiverno not only will it verify that, but it will also you know kind of if I go back once that pod is running. Um, whoops! So, oh, I already had that pod running. Uh, so let's delete that. Okay, and we'll try it again. Let's make sure that this is okay, good. All right, so it got created. The other thing I wanted to show is once it's created, Kiverno is also, so this policy is kind of interesting because it does both a validation of the image based on your public key, as well as it's checking. Uh, once it validates, it will also then, you know, it gets the digest from the cosine response uh, that's coming back from the registry and it mutates the workload with that particular um, digest itself, right? So that's why when I'm looking at my pod definition now, 
uh, it automatically replaced like what I had was I just gave it, you know, my registry, but now it has digest, which is just an added kind of security check to make sure that we that image becomes immutable. Um, all right, so that's a quick demo of what it would look like, you know, what, uh, what you can do for the image verification piece. Uh, but let me, the other thing I can quickly highlight is also just in terms of pod security, um, you know, and it's very, very straightforward with Giverno. Um, we have, so if you go to our documentation and yeah, so if you go to the Kiverno docs, you go to the policies link, um, and you go to pod security. I'm going to apply a number of different, and these, these policies follow the pod security standards. So I'm just going to apply those to my cluster. Um, so what it's doing is it will, you know, kind of look at that repo, it will customize it. And this customization is just switching it to enforce mode. So I'm going to demonstrate what it looks like if we are now going to inject a bad pod, which has some, you know, things which are not allowed by these policies. This is the set of policies, you know, of which it will, and again, these follow the pod security standards. Um, so it's, you know, you can choose whether you apply them in baseline or restricted, which are the two security levels itself, right? Um, so once that's, you know, installed, what I'm gonna do is I, you know, I like this for demos. There's a site, if you haven't seen this, it's bad pods in the Bishop Fox repo. So they have some pretty interesting pods which you can use to test different things. What I'm gonna do is apply this pod YAML, uh, which is allowing everything, right? So like it says here, there's a lot of you know, problems with this pod definition and we'll go ahead and apply that. So by the way, right now, if I look at you know, um, you know, my cluster policies, CPOL is a short form for that. It shows me all the policies. So we had our image verification and all of these other policies. So let's try and run that pod, see what happens. And as expected, you know, Kiverno kind of uh, spits out a bunch of issues with that pod. And, you know, most of these are fairly clear. It's telling us don't use host namespaces, don't use host path, uh, make sure you, you don't, you're don't not running as privileged and the run as non-root. So those are the four things, four policies it violated, which is what we're showing here. So again, very quick demo of, you know, what can be done. Uh, if you go back to the Kiverno site, there's a lot of different samples. There's about 60 plus, I think, uh, and growing samples. These are all contributed through the community. And there's a pod security section, which you can use to install, just like I showed what can be done with this library. So let me pause there. I know we're slightly over time. Um, so based on you know other agenda items, you can either address questions now, or we're happy to answer them separately over um, you know, on, on chat. So folks, this is the time for you all to start asking questions. As a quick reminder, Kyverno is one of the projects that is helping the security tag out with our Security Pals pilot. So this is a wonderful first presentation from one of those groups. Yeah, and thank you, Emily, for that reminder. So I did have a slide and I want to give a shout out to John. He's been working with me on this. So we do have a self-assessment here. And some of the items we're working on, you know, are in terms of the role definitions, um, the overall security pro processes for our project, uh, we're going to create in the docs itself, there will be a new uh, security documentation section we'll add. Um, another two couple of interesting things which go beyond Kiverno, we talked about bad policies and threat models for policies. So certainly very interested in exploring that topic. And then in general on securing admission controllers, right? Uh, that's a pretty interesting uh, topic as well as for Gatekeeper or Kiverno or other admission controllers is what would be the type of attack models for admission controllers and what can we do to you know, uh, improve the security of those. I've got one uh, question. That was, that was great, uh, um, great, very interesting. One quick question I had was around uh, policies. Is there are there plans to have like versioned policies for where the Kubernetes API changes? So I'm thinking like where in in one nineteen seccomp was an at it went from being an annotation to being part of security context. Yes, yeah, so Kiverno, um, of course, the schema itself is versioned today. Um, 
one of the things we annotations we support is the Kiverno version, which supports a particular policy. But I think that's a pretty interesting idea. We don't have a way of versioning a policy right now. Um, you can roll out a policy as just like with any other Kiverno resource or Kubernetes resource. But it would be interesting to yeah, have an idea to say that this policy should match this version of Kubernetes. Uh, or maybe it doesn't apply if if it's a different version of Kubernetes. Yeah, I'll bring up the thing. I'm actually going to make a quick note of that because that would be a good check to add. What other questions do folks have? I, I one of the one um, just. Do you, do you see any customers running, um, and this kind of goes to your point around the attack model for admission controllers, do you see anyone running Kiverno outside of the cluster that's being protected? So essentially running as a workload in another cluster to so that if I'm an attacker and I get access to one node that happens to be running the, the admission controller, I can't just essentially delete it or bypass it. So as an admission controller, of course, it would have to be inside the cluster you're trying to protect. You can operate Kiverno uh, you know, via the command line tool. So that would be applicable for like scanning configurations or you know, validating configurations externally. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, so, but running it outside, yeah, maybe I didn't completely follow your, your, the idea, but uh, oh. it wouldn't help enforce policies then oh. within those target clusters. Yeah. So I was thinking is because it's a webhook. So you can essentially say the cluster calls the admission control on the webhook. The web could outside. be somewhere else. So if yeah. an attacker, you know, is trying to come, right. you know, you get, they get the nodes in one right. cluster, they can't gotcha. just take, yeah. take it out essentially. Uh, that's The question there would be, you know, the allowed latencies and things like that. Because again, yeah, now your webhook is running externally. Um, I think a more another interesting discussion there would be, you know, and I know that there's another project called Coop Warden, which is trying to use Vasm. Um, to try and also, you know, you know, see how that can help with security, but there's that's certainly worthy of discussion. I think the question becomes, yeah, can you tolerate, you know, the, that external call and latencies uh, within each admission request, and how would that scale? Yeah, yeah. Can you repeat what's the name of that other project, please? Coop Borden. Coop Borden. Okay. Yes. Crossled is trying to do something similar. It's my understanding as well. Okay. Yeah, one interesting thing, and I haven't, you know, I'm just uh, I've been thinking about this. I haven't really explored this in any detail, but it would be today admission controllers are supported as webhooks. It would be interesting if there's a, you know, kind of a more native mode, right, to run tools like Kiverno uh, using Vasm, uh, just like, you know, um, uh, can be done with Istio, for example, or with. Um, um, you know, other, other solutions um, and to have policy controls embedded, you know, closer to the admission, to the API server itself. Because any, any degree of separation introduces more chances of failure and brings up some complications and how to handle those, right? Yeah, I'd agree. And that's kind of like where I think, where, the, where I think Caverno has got an advantage over solutions that are less embedded in Kubernetes, because it's closer to Kubernetes, it's got a better chance of understanding the weirdnesses that are the Kubernetes right. API. Right. Yeah, so certainly I think this, the, and happy to, you know, if folks want to collaborate on this, just understanding the threat model for admission controllers and exploring some alternatives, very interested in pursuing that. So uh, we can, you know, maybe have a deeper discussion on that. That's a great idea, Jim. Um, if anybody is actually interested in leading that effort, I would recommend a proposal be submitted as an issue within the SAG repo. That way we can determine who's interested and maybe get that added um, as a project in the future. Or um, if not interested in leading, maybe make a suggestion in the issues and we'll see if we get interest later on. I'd be happy to, to, to take that one as a thing. I'll do. I'll, I'll put an issue in. That would be great. Thanks, Rory. Of course. What other questions does everyone have? 
Uh, Jim, I had one question. So you mentioned this. Uh, are you familiar with anyone using this Kiberno policy in CI/CD? In one of your uh, chat you showed, like the, it is CLI and CI/CD. What kind of policies people are using in that? In that? Yeah. So you know what we recommend, and for at least for our customers at Nirmata who are running Kiberno, uh, we you know they do run um, uh, also. Uh, Kiverno in the CI/CD pipeline just to validate and give feedback as part of the build tools itself. So developers then see the you know violations there before they it goes into any cluster, right? It's just a quicker uh, way to give that uh, feedback uh, to somebody submitting any YAML. So all the same policies can be run. The only differences are, of course, um, you know some variables and things like that. You might have to. Uh, you could you could pass in into the command line tool if those are not available uh, by lookups through the admission server um, or the API server in Kubernetes. Okay, yeah, thanks. Jim, if, if you could direct the audience that you're talking to for how to come in and contribute to the project, where would you like to direct their attention? Are there areas you're looking for help or low hanging fruit? Yeah, so for this group, of course, you know, like the the work that John and I are doing around like the uh, Kiverno, you know, self assessment and just uh, that would be one very interesting area. We are also, you know, in just Kiverno in, in itself, like some of the new extensions I, I demoed the image verification. So that's a pretty interesting area. And then, you know, what a, a possible extension of that is moving to sign policies, also leveraging cosine and SIGSTOR. So that would be a fantastic area of people looking to contribute or join the project. Um, we are on the Kubernetes Slack and, uh, the, you know, this was confusing to me for a long time that uh, there's a, on the Kubernetes Slack, we have a Kiverno channel. We're not on the CNCF Slack. So if you, you know, want to reach out and um, interact with the Kubernetes community just, or the Kiverno community, uh, that's the best place to find us. Amazing. And you run a company that supports the project. We know we often struggle how to get compensated for doing open source work. So uh, perhaps not the channel to announce that, but I do want to give a, sh a shout out for building a, a company around an open source project and encourage folks to check out your website, see if there's any positions open. Really Thank you. Work. What other questions does anybody have? This has been um, a great presentation from Kyverno. Um, I know I have one for them. How did you find the Security Palace process to date? Was the engagement good? Um, did it allow you to think about security in a different manner? What parts of your process in developing Kyverno have you changed as a result? Yeah, good question. So certainly very, helpful just in, in terms of, um, and I think going through the self-assessment and preparing for it um, in at least within our team itself raised a lot of questions. So, and, you know, working with John has been good. It's mostly, you know, most of the items of course and uh, challenges have been scheduling and timing on our side, right? Uh, one thing, you know, and there were a couple of feedback items that John and I discussed, which would be interesting, I feel, not, not just uh, you know, for, for the tag, but in general for CNCF projects. Seems like there are certain things that could be standardized, right? In terms of how all of the process, uh, projects are managing their security processes, um, you know, disclosures, things like that, reporting. Because um, you know, rather than having each project invent their own, you know, if there's a template or a standard, uh, which most CNCF projects adopt, then it could be done earlier in the project life cycle. John, anything uh, to add to that or? No, I think that's it to sort of, um, to add a bit of color on that, the, the idea we're thinking of, I got on my notes, I haven't sent it back upstream yet, Emily and, and team, but um, could we basically put together a sort of a stack of documents? So when you come into CNCF, okay, you're a new project, you're a sandbox, you obviously, as we came up with security policy, you're, you're not experienced in this area. Here's a starting point, here's the templates. Um, and then we can go through and are they, the, the, the org can go through and the project can go through and modify those as necessary. Um, 
No, I, I think that the, the standard comment we've we've had in, we've been talking about this a little is is yeah, people have time constraints, right? It's how do we how can we most easily make this both understandable and easy for you guys to adopt and get into while you're trying to run a project, get it, you know, adopted, and then in your case also run a business. So I think that's sort of the type of stuff that we're we're trying to figure out how to make this as easy as possible. So the standard docs is an interesting topic of discussion. Um, there is, so one of the things that the CNCF strives to do is not be overly prescriptive and in how um, individual projects govern themselves. There are some like general guidelines and expectations that the CNCF has. Now that doesn't prohibit us from creating some templates and some guides and basically saying, we made them, they're here for you to consume and use if you would like and feel free to tailor and adjust as necessary and we try to cut, follow along those lines but i wouldn't expect the cncf to come out and say you must use these particular templates i could probably venture a guess and say that you need to have something in, in the way of that in order for you to graduate but i think this is it's a really good idea um i think that would be a prime topic for a suggestion or another project or a proposal in the future, something this group can certainly contribute to. There are yeah, I would say it's not about the, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say there's a few open issues that cover this. Um, the one that's being acted on in the next, it's being kicked off the next few weeks is um, starting at the really, really basic, which is like, going through and seeing everybody's like CII docs, the, the security related things that follow that. And then, you know, maybe creating an automated dashboard. And then we could layer on top of that, right? Where we could do is say, okay, well, if you name your files, this and such, then you'll show up in the dashboard automatically. Otherwise you have to submit a PR. And those types of things could, I think, work towards standardization in a way that makes things consumable for the people interested in using the projects. So I would, my, my take on standard docs is actually different from a, it's not related to the project governance itself. Uh, it's actually related to the CNCF processes themselves, which have undergone many iterations. So, and be it on the incubation process itself or the review process within the SIG, within the tags, um, it's just, it, it feels like when we're going to find examples, we find 20 different styles and having to know which one, because they've all evolved over time, people take in very different ways. So even just on um, the CNCF processes themselves, having standard inbound documents for the products to submit would be a huge help. That has been voiced before, and it is good feedback that it is still needs work. I also had a question for Jim, nobody else. Sure. Um, you did a great job of explaining the difference between um, this and OPA and uh, your policy um, expression and rego. Um, my question is, have you considered some kind of interop? Because we have projects that, like one of the things that we often do, or you know, I've done in the security mm -hmm. assessments that I've been involved in is say, hey, it would be great if you gave an example of how somebody secures your project. And it would be great if they didn't say, well, have an example of OPA and an example right. of, you know, and so if right. you brought up WASM, like it would be amazing if there was like a standard WASM, these things compiled to or something, something. Have you thought about that? Yeah, and, and that's in fact, you know, what some of the initiatives, Robert and I are working with the policy working group, it's right around there, right? And um, one, one challenge we saw is of course, um, and, and I don't know who, but somebody had uh, expressed this very well as they said, in any, any kind of interesting domain, there's typically three types of solutions, right? There's a native solution, there's a DSL that's created to solve the problem, uh, and then there's a general purpose programming language type solution. And I think we're seeing all three play out for Kubernetes uh, policy management, right? Um, so the, the challenge we kind of see in the working group is, Perhaps the language is not the right thing to standardize, but at least if we can standardize things around it, or should there be some, you know, for necessary policies like pod security, should there be other tools created to know that those policies are enforced, right, and applicable? So those are all great discussion points. I don't know the answer to that. I think 
Um, seems like language discussions always get uh, into sort of, uh, you know, pros and cons, and there's always trade-offs. So it tends to be what, what the different roles prefer. Uh, but totally agree with your idea on how do you at least make sure that the right policies are running and is there a tool for that? In the working group, what we you know, figured is the easiest um, possible thing to start with is perhaps the policy outputs, the report. So that's what we're looking at standardizing first. Uh, or it's maybe even again, standardize might be the wrong term, but at least having a recommendation there to say, hey, here's a common format. If you can output in this format, now it's very simple to see uh, any policy result through kubectl or standard uh, other to Kubernetes tools, right? Through the API server. Yeah, and I wasn't, I, I understand like there are people who love YAML or JSON or XML, God forbid, or sorry to editorialize there, or like an actual like, you know, programming language. But I think that there's an opportunity to standardize on the kind of basic object models, right? right? If I have a, something in OPA that says, you know, something about a port or an IP address and something in Caverno that says the exact same thing, I should be able to compare those things without like writing multiple parsers. Right. Likewise, if I'm going to supply really basic policies with my service that is not a security service, then it would be great to express those in ways that either OPA or um, Kverno could ingest. It, that would be, you know, it would be normalized rather than standardized. Mm. Yeah, that, that would be an interesting topic. I certainly worked more discussion and thought in terms of um, is it possible to have that, you know, the ability to introspect and see um, what those policies are doing and compare uh, the actual, you know, outcomes or desired behaviors. Thanks. All right, so we've got about three minutes left. Um, just want to put a quick reminder out there that uh, Kyverno is in the Kubernetes Slack, not the CNCF Slack. So if you're interested in chatting them up about some of these topics, maybe contributing, um, go over to the Kubernetes Slack and it's just Kyverno is the channel name to be able to jump in, provide contributions. Jim, I would like to thank you so much for your time today and presenting and answering all of our questions. As security professionals, we don't often get to have presentations from the community. So this has been a real pleasure. And John Kinsella, thank you so much for working with Caverno and the Security Pals effort. Um, we're very interested in seeing what the results of that come out with. Does anybody have any last minute questions before we let everyone go? Good stuff. Keep it up. Thank you. Thanks for Thank having you. me. Yep. And last minute reminders, Cloud Native Security Con, KubeCon. If you have not registered, go ahead and register. Um, details are in the Tag Security channel. Thanks again, everyone, and have a wonderful Free codes. day. <laughs> what, Andres? Free codes. Unfortunately not. Um, we're working on maybe having virtual codes, but I'm not sure yet. So stay tuned. Stay Thanks, tuned. everyone. Thanks, Emily. See you guys.